Hi, welcome back to Super Mom Infinity. My name is Holly, and today I want to share with you all a mini beginner guide to autism. Um, after finding out my daughter had autism when she was two years old, I did not know what to do. I did not know where to start. I did not know anything about autism. And today I want to share with you mother to mother, parent to parent, um, some of the emotions that I went through and how I overcame them and what I did next. When you find out your child has autism, what's next? Do we just sit there? Do we just, like, what do we do? autism what is autism what do we do when we find out our child has autism what do we do what do we do y'all what do we do do we just sit there and cry and mope and just be depressed or sad or worried and of course we're going to go through some of those emotions and those feelings and also go through denial not wanting to believe that your child has autism or have any disability is hard to take in at once. But after a week, after a week of crying, <laughs> calling um, my family and my friends and just hearing them be so positive, that's one thing that most definitely had helped me just build myself up, build the strength that I needed up and know that I am her mom and I will be the one that's going to be taking care of her and it's going to help her walk her journey and tackle this this ability with joy so you guys starting with number one i have is research when you find out your child has uh, autism you most definitely want to start researching um get familiar with it get familiar with the different kinds of autism because autism is to me how I term wait how I I guess defined it I would say that autism is a spectrum from one to a billion different signs and symptoms and not every child with autism is the same period <laughs> they have a few symptoms or signs that are similar so with research it is so very important to become familiar with it, to know some of the signs. Signs are things that you observe with your eyes, that you see your child is doing, that you physically, visually see them doing. Um, and symptoms are what is going on internal, inside of them, that they cannot express, especially being so young. And those are the things that we have to kind of like figure out. And also with the signs, you want to figure out why they're doing that. Or because she's holding her ears, is she in pain? Is she in discomfort? Like, wh what is a way that I can help her to be more comfortable when she do present these signs or she do show a certain behavior or when she acts out or anything? You want to go through... Um, and just do a lot of research and be familiar with the different levels. And I think that is so, so very, very important. It's the ground base. And that is something that I had to do. And I, when I initially looked up autism, I was like, okay, so where's the manual? And I'm just going to read it. I'm going to buy all these books about autism and I'm going to read them. And I'm going to know how to take care of my child. And that's not the case. <laughs> It's, it's very, very helpful, but that is not the case. And this is the initial step for creating and building your own autistic manual, something that is going to help you monitor, keep track of their behavior, and also present these symptoms and signs to your, um, to your doctor. Let them be aware of it because they can also help you as well. It's a lot of research out there and it's a lot of um, interventions and implementations that us as parents have to utilize. So, <laughs> okay, 
Um, so number one is research. So do your research. Please do your research. Don't be like me for like a week and be late doing your research. But after crying for a week, I had to jump on board and I was like, let's go. It's time. Let me figure out what this is. Let me see how I can help my baby. Let me just go to the next step and make sure that she has everything that she needs, all the resources, all the early intervention. So, and that is so very, very important. And if you guys are not familiar with the ABA Pathways program, it is abapathways.com. And they um, were with ECI when Alea was with ECI for speech and language um, therapy. And when I tell you we started that program initially before we just dived into speech therapy, it is like the base foundation of building communication. And that includes eye contact, answering to um, their name, um, simple commands. If you are not familiar with it, just look into it. Go to um, abapathways.com and um, the base foundation of communication it is it is absolutely amazing to help them build those skills you guys here are a few examples of the research that you can do to become familiar with autism you could read brochures articles handouts etc you can also google go to pinterest um, look up autism mom bloggers because there are parents and educators and all of the above sharing their stories, sharing their resources, signs and symptoms, early interventions that they have implemented into their lifestyle. And these are so very important to initially start the research process just to become familiar and understand and be able to pinpoint out those signs and symptoms. Reading is helpful as well. Reading resources and books um, from Amazon uh, written by doctors and a lot of professionals that have studied um, children in this area with autism. So reading is so very important and also very, very helpful as well. And you can also um, relate some of your symptoms to some of the symptoms that may be included in the book and find implementations and, and early interventions that you can relate to or that can help you gain more knowledge of autism. Number four, um, joining autism groups can be helpful as well. You can get the insight of other moms, parents, and educators that share their stories, share their signs and symptoms, and possibly be able to relate to them or just gain knowledge and a little bit more understanding Number five is ask questions wherever you go. When you do start um, early interventions with specialists, ask them questions. Write your questions down and have them ready for them. Ask anything and everything that you can possibly think of. Number two is observe. Observe your child. Observe their behavior. Observe their body language. Observe their facial expressions. Observe them so you could be familiar of what is bothering them, what they like, what they don't like, how they are responding to certain foods, um, the textures of certain foods. Maybe they, they probably don't even want the texture of like wet fruit on their tongue or um, crunchy pretzels or something. They may stimulate uh, their auditory and hurt their ears. Um, we just never know. So you have to observe your child. It can go from um, the tags on their clothes, the tightness of the socks around their ankle, um, whether they like long sleeves or short sleeves. I have learned that Alea, I call it her specific preferences. She has her specific preferences and she likes long sleeves. She do not like short sleeves. She don't like wearing socks. She barely like wearing hair bows. Um, it could be the tightness or it could be the material. So just observe your baby, observe your babies and see, and just make a list. This is what has helped me make a list of what they like, they don't like, how they are presenting themselves, if they like to be outside in the rain, if they like to be outside in the um in the sun or how they migrate away from other children just observe these behaviors and just become familiar with them and start thinking of um ways that let me see what i can do to make her comfortable how can i 
if we go outside and there's an airplane flying by and the cars are going and the wind is blowing and the leaves are rustling in the grass and she's just holding her ears and we don't know where which sound is triggering her to hold her ears it's it's a sign to let you know that she's uncomfortable and so what do we do hmm let's think we could probably take her back in the house and bypass her playing with other friends and knowing that she needs to socialize or interact with other children let's see what we can do like we have to come up with a plan of what is going to help them what's going to make them more comfortable that is one sign that she did that i observed her doing and it just really really um it just put like I guess the cherry on top or the nail on the head to let me know that, okay, I could see a lot more um, autistic signs. I could see it now. And it's kind of like just closing in on me to where like, you know, I'm not in denial. I can't be in denial because I see her in distress, uncomfortable, or I see her doing these things that I have researched. And I'm like, oh, wow. And so just observe your babies, get to make a list. This is so very important. Please make a list, observe your babies and start writing out the things that they do. So number one was do your research. If you have to make, just write out everything um, so you could become familiar with it, so you could memorize it. Um, so you'll be able to pinpoint those signs and symptoms, pinpoint those behaviors and be able to collect all of this so you can present it to your to your doctor or your support group, your care team, and also um, observe your baby. Make a list. Make a list, list of their signs and symptoms of what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, when they're doing it. It's so very important. Number two, observe your child. Um, Observe their behavior, observe how they are acting and what is causing them to act this way or act like they are in so much joy or so much distress. So you could pinpoint out those triggers and target those triggers or eliminate those triggers. Um, number two is body language. Um, sometimes when your child is not verbally speaking or pronouncing it in those words and it's hard to communicate, their body language says a thousand words and we can learn from their body language um, a lot of their likes and their dislikes as well. Number three is likes. Um, observe the likes. Include more of their likes into their activities of daily living. And the same with number four, their dislikes. We as parents, we want to eliminate those dislikes. We want to make our child more comfortable and just observing their likes and dislikes. It can help you. Um, number five is nutritional intake. This is so very important. I have learned with anemia and constipation, we need to balance iron and fiber. Um, and being constipated can make you cranky. So we want to include those extra fluids and extra foods that offer fiber and the nutritional intake also can minimize the um, behavior, help your child sleep at nighttime, um, help them be less cranky. Um, so having three meals a day, two snacks, offering that alternative if they don't like um, a specific food, they may not like the texture and we have to just pay attention to those things and just be a little bit more um, understanding when they don't want to eat. I know back in the day, it's like you got to make a happy plate, whatever I put on your plate, you got to eat it. But after realizing that, you know, there are certain disabilities, sensory um, disorders and, and how a layer presents herself during mealtime, I try to make it more pleasant and relaxing and give her alternatives and options and how your child can balance their bowel movements, um, especially with fiber and water, because also constipation can be a um, symptom of autism. And so we need those intakes. Um, and also anemia. Anemia is seen a lot with autistic children and we need a lot of iron.
And also with constipation, um, monitoring whether they're pooping every day, how many times a day, is it hard, form, soft, loose, etc. And also with the urine, you want to make sure that they're peeing, they, um, there's no odor to it because children can get a UTI, children can become constipated. Constipation may definitely make you cranky. Having um, irritation or a UTI can also make children cranky as well. So these are some um, good things to also look out for as well. And so you guys, number three is adapt. Um, so I'll give you an example by adapting. Alea, when she plays with her toys sometimes, and she used to do it more frequently when she was like 18 months to two years to two and a half years. Because right now she's three and she's really not doing it. You'll catch her every now and then. But um, adapt. If she's lining up something, line it up too. Line it up, sort it up by color. Um, and me, I even like pull one out of the line just to see how she's going to react. And she, she's just like, hey, like that's not supposed to be out of place. That needs to be in place. So adapting as well can be like if she migrates away from the kids at the park and she wants to go play in the sand and the rocks. Just you know, participate, be active, and adapt. Adapt to how she's feeling in her surroundings, and that'll help you to better understand. Because when I sat on the floor with her and I start lining things up, and while she was already lining things up, and I was like, why does she like this? I'm wondering, like, after she lines it up, she has a sense of satisfaction, like she accomplished something. I was like, okay, so let me see. So maybe I can see if she can line up the numbers or line up certain um, color sorting or animals and just, you know, make it a fun learning adventure. Um, help her develop, help your baby develop their developmental skills or fine motor skills during um, during their playtime, during, during this time of you adapting with them and adapting to their behavior. To review over adapt to your child, Number one is adapt to their activities of daily living. Um, this is just everything that your child do in the day. Um, eating, bathing, sleeping, dressing, all those good things that your child do in the day are their activities of daily living. So you wanna adapt to it. Um, your child may like to sit on the floor and eat. They may not like to sit in the chair. It may be too hard for them. It may be uncomfortable. They don't like the texture. And so it's just a little modifications to help you all compromise those are modifications also that you can implement into y'all's daily activities and number two is their interest so you all adapt to their interest just like if they want to sit on the floor again you may want to adapt to their interest get involved sit on the floor with them show them that you know whether they like to sit on the floor or the chair it doesn't make them any difference it's just their specific preferences number three is specific preferences and you will learn and see that your child has specific preferences every child even i have specific preferences i don't like to drive with the radio on i like it nice and calm and so your child may also like that same thing these are their specific preferences um and this is one area that i just believe that all children have specific preferences whether they have a disability or not and so number four is dislikes with you seeing and adapting to their dislikes you'll know how to prevent them you'll know what they don't like and you'll know ways that will be able to help them because something that they dislike can make them uncomfortable they can make them agitated or irritated and these are the things that we're trying to eliminate we're trying to prevent these things and of course a lot of things just happen um suddenly unwillingly but also giving them um comfortable cues to let them know that everything is going to be okay and just try to eliminate some of the dislikes number five is modifications um, modifications just as well as sitting on the floor instead of sitting at the table to eat or not wearing socks because you don't like wearing socks or creating a quiet area for your child to go to when they're overstimulated so having modifications and making a few adjustments just to help your child to be more comfortable and number five Four. Number four is nurture. You want to nurture. You want to make sure that they're eating healthy, three meals, two snacks. You want to make sure they're getting adequate amount of sleep. Um, and that can be very challenging. You also want to make sure that you're giving them that love and that affection. 
um, Alea, she shows her love by kissing her hand or saying nah and um, she also is very very touchy and her touchy and she's touchy where she's kind of rough like I'm like girl you gonna choke me like you hugging me too hard now you have to teach them gentle and light, lighten up some <laughs> and um but nurturing and just being there and having that one-on-one -on -one time or, you know, that quality time, that communication time is so very, very important. And they need to know that they they are loved. Like, I love my baby and I'm sure you guys love y'all baby too. You have to show it. Um, kiss on them, hug them, make it a routine. Just let them know that um, they're doing a good job also and praising them. is just all of the nurturing aspects of being a mother of, in motherhood. And um, also like for family and friends, you want them to, you know, let the baby know, let them know that they're being loved. Um, and cause we never know like how hard or if it is even hard for them and battling autism like we don't know really what's going on in their brains you guys these babies need love they definitely need that love that nurture that um those hugs and those kisses and so that is nurturing um especially meals and sleep and um their growth and development just making sure that you know you're keeping track of that so when you go to the um doctor you'll be able to present them with hey um she's two and she's not walking yet or something like that anything or she doesn't want to eat food period like you have to observe those because it could be more underlining issues um that we need to address or that needs to be taken care of so you guys we gotta nurture our babies we gotta kiss on them quick review of nurture your child number four hugs kisses quality time can let them know that you are there for them you want to be there for them and they could feel that um number four is encourage independence um nurturing your child giving them that independence that self-esteem that they need to build their confidence number five is talk 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 always talk to your baby when you're dressing them in the tub when you step outside talk to them explain what their surroundings look like explain the material of clothes that you're putting on them or whether it's the pants or shirts socks or shoes and they begin to understand those words even if they're not able to pronounce those words or they're not saying those words they can be able to recognize those words those sounds that are coming out of your beautiful mouth and they will be able to respond a whole lot better so just talk 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 talking is wonderful reading books all of that good stuff <laughs> and number six is listen listen to them listen to their body language listen to their facial expressions because at an early age some babies are not able to talk yet and like Alea, she is still working on her oral mechanics to pronunciate those words so other people can understand because i understand <laughs> but listen because those babbles and what they're trying to say, they are really, really trying to say something. So be engaged, be um, attentive and just listen. Number seven is nutrition. You do want to make sure that your child has the supplements, the nourishment that they need to grow and develop healthy. And also you want to make sure that they are getting iron fiber and those things that prevent constipation anemia a lot of medical diagnoses that come along with children with autism number eight is sleep when you need your sleep and i'm sure your baby needs their sleep so most definitely a sleeping routine a sleeping schedule um it was so hard at first in the beginning this baby was getting up around three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, oh no, we cannot be doing this. So having a very, very good sleeping schedule and a sleeping routine is so very important for both you and the baby. Number five is my favorite. Um, it is life changing. Intervention is when you start receiving assistance from professionals um that will help you 
with your child to help you understand, to help you with techniques to share and show and teach your baby. Um, Early intervention includes like physical therapy, um, like if your child it is crazy, um, because I saw on a CDC guideline like Alea was supposed to be hopping on one foot, and I'm like, hopping on one foot, and um, and she was like, I think it was for a two year old, and I was like, come on, Alea, come on, let's go play, let's go hop, let's let me see if you can hop, and I'm like, oh no, nope, she can't hop, <laughs> and on one foot, and I was like, no, I'm not gonna worry myself. Some of the guidelines and with the um therapy that we was in. They kind of like are like this, like you're supposed to hop at 18 months, supposed to hop at two years old, supposed to hop at three. I'm like, when's she supposed to be hopping? And so I just give her, I still give her time because every child develops at a different pace, rate, etc. So just because they're not hopping on one foot or um, like can open a water bottle does not mean that they severely need some attention in that area just give them some time practice um and when i say uh give them some time to practice another example was when she was evaluated by the uh, speech therapist they were saying they sat down on the floor and they were saying like um alea put the monkey on the tree and i'm like i don't i don't even like teacher the word tree like how would she know between the difference or between the two and so I was like when y'all come can y'all like give me a refresher so I can go like go over some words with her and see if you know so when y'all come she can be familiar with the words and she'll know to put it on or even to pick up like pick up um, it was something that, you know, you have to teach a child. They see something on the floor, you say, pick it up, pick it up. And it's a repetition to when they, you know, begin to grasp it and understand, okay, pick it up means to like raise up. Oh, okay. Now I understand it. So, um, that was something that I was working with her and began to work with her on like, uh, building her vocabulary, understanding what, a lot of images are, a lot of objects are, reading her a lot of books so she can understand those images and encouraging her to point so she'll know what that image is and also knowing the purpose of that image um, because you can pass her a cup and she could be like, oh, okay, um, let me put these, uh, let me put the Play-Doh in here or let me do something else with it and you have to still show them and teach them and the repetition will definitely begin to stick so do not get overwhelmed when your child is not understanding or following those simple commands it's because when you give a command walk with them through the command until the uh until the command is completed so they can understand okay let me go get the ball oh this is a ball let me go put the ball in the bucket oh that's a bucket we have to teach them because they're still babies even though you know not they're not following simple commands they're still babies they don't know what every word in a dictionary is yet that is our job to teach them what every word in the dictionary is <laughs> so with this um so with a a good care team baby's gonna be fine you guys baby's gonna be fine to give you guys some ideas of early interventions that are available. Um, for number one, we have speech therapy. This program builds communication skills, helps develop those oral mechanics to help them pronunciate those words and pr pronunciate those sounds. With repetition and imitating will help them pronunciate those words and, and understand those words and build their vocabulary. Number two is the ABA's Pathways program. They will teach and show strategies that can help with communication skills, behavioral skills. The ABA's Pathways program stops at um, when your child is a toddler. And so that is why it is so very important to find those resources, get the early, early intervention because some of these programs do stop. And as well as with ECI, once your child turns three, they are transferred to other um, speech therapists 
maybe with your um, insurance or the school districts as well. So these um, early intervention programs are so very, very important to go ahead and initially start them. Whether you're in denial or not, just knowing that this is something that I'm doing for my child and it's going to help them progress and learn strategies for both you and your baby. Um, number four is physical therapy. Um, this program will help strengthen muscles and practice exercises to help build those muscles, help them develop those body mechanics to participate, um, effectively and actively in their activities of daily living. Number five is OT. They do also exercises to help them build, um, the strength that they need, uh, also with social and emotional and physical needs that help them participate in their activities of daily living. Um, number six is Autism Center for Children. And this is a variety, a collective of services offered, um, evaluations to pinpoint where the developmental delay is. Also one-on-one -on -one interaction. They also offer ABA um, training programs. I call it ABA redirecting. Um, number seven is the school district resources. Once your child is school age, they will not receive um, ABA pathways anymore or early childhood interventions, um, which is considered ECI. They will be with the school district and resources provided by them and also additional resources that you may have with your insurance or private resources that are paid. Um, so the school district do um, have resources. They have the PT, the OT, the speech therapist that will come in or the special education program. So it is all of these resources. It is so very important that you go through each one. You research it to see what you have available in your area. And you may also have more available in your area and just give them all a try. Um, so other ABA Pathways programs, some of them are intense. Some of them I declined because they were a little too intense for a two-year-old. But the other Pathways program that we are currently on, which is the Autism Center for Children, it seems a little bit more delicate and more calm and relaxing and more um, age-appropriate for Alea. This is why it is so very important to do their research, to read over it, to ask questions and see how do they operate? What is you all's routine? How you, what are the benefits that my child will gain? All of those amazing questions. Um, your pediatrician, which is number nine, they will make implementations. They will also um, diagnose whether your child has anemia or constipation, they will do evaluations. They will look at those things. And these are the things that also can subside behaviors, confusion, questions that you need answered as well. Your pediatrician and our pediatrician is great, amazing, and has been um, so very helpful with giving me some understanding and a lot of resources. And you can learn a lot. Present everything to your pediatrician. I have included a PDF printout in the description below, the beginning of your autism guide. And these are the five steps, initial five steps that you most definitely want to take and are so very, very important. This resource is free and all you have to do is look down at the bottom of the video in the description area, click on that link and print it out or just save it. And it is amazing. I am here giving you guys what me and Alea has went through. And these are the steps that I had took and remember taking and what has helped me to begin the beginning of our autism journey, you guys. So I know I'm going to talk. I try to make this video short. Oh my goodness. Okay, so um, please stay tuned for more. I'm going to do a uh, part two to this video to include some more with the um, beginner guide. And you guys, if you haven't hit that notification bell, you got to hit it. So I will see you all next time. Thank you for watching.